Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. Redemption by Tracy Hunter Abramson Gage Stewart has spent five years trying to overcome his past. Once an abused and troubled teenager, he has worked tirelessly to move beyond the fateful day he was manipulated into holding a group of teenagers hostage. Now with a new identity and a college degree in criminal psychology, he accepts an unlikely job teaching others what to do during mass shootings. At the hotel where his class is held, Gage is immediately drawn to Skylar Prescott, the daughter of the wealthy hotel owner. Gage and Skylar quickly discover a shared desire for normalcy, and their easy friendship soon develops into something more. But after a night out ends in horror, when a gunman opens fire in the crowded venue, they make an alarming discovery that threatens more than their relationship. The attack was little more than a publicity stunt to draw out the real target, presidential candidate Senator James Whitmore. Unwilling to become someone's scapegoat, Gage must now work in tandem with the very men who ended his own life of crime before it began, the Saint Squad. Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I'm so glad you joined me. Today I'm chatting with Tracy Hunter Abramson. She was born in Arizona, but then she moved to Venezuela, and now she lives, I don't know where, but she used to work for the Central Intelligence Agency, and I think that probably gives a lot of color to her book, so welcome to my show, Tracy. Well, thank you, and I live in Virginia, actually. Oh, okay. I do, too. We'll talk offline about where. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. You, we don't need to dive down that, that rabbit hole yet. So it sounds like you've lived in a lot of different places. Do you find that that gives you, um, you know, color and, and ideas for setting locations for your books? Do you have a particular area of the country you like to put your, your um, characters in? I, I definitely think it helps a lot because not only I, – I tend to write a lot of, like, Navy SEALs and CIA and that type of thing. So, you know, Virginia, Virginia Beach, um, you know, the D.C. area, all of that is, is often a favorite for me. But people, the characters, you know, people working for the CIA and in the military and things like that, they're from everywhere. And mm -hmm. so being from – you know, living in Virginia for so many years but then being from the West – um, I think is great because then I can, you know, like, for example, if you're talking in Virginia, one of the most common freeways is I-95. But if you're in, say, Utah, it's like the 17 or, or whatever, the 15, I guess it is. You know, so it's like the right. in front of whatever the interstate is. So little things like that you wouldn't know if you haven't lived in the different places. Right. So you kind of use that to give your, your books that authentic setting, Right. Absolutely, yeah, and and I also do a lot of before COVID. I did a lot yeah. of traveling, and so I would like if I went to Europe, then any place I thought was interesting. Like I like to travel as a not as a tourist, but like as a local, and mm -hmm. so I try to blend in. And so, like you know, how do you open the door in the metro? You know, on the on the subway in Paris versus. You know, in the United States, usually the subway doors just open, but that you have to push a button in Europe. So, you know, things like that, you just, again, adding richness. Right, right. right. And I think that um, it, it's always interesting when you've been someplace, even as a tourist, you know, like I've mm -hmm. been to Paris, so I know you have to push the button to open. <laughs> we rode the subway, right. you know, and I love their Art Deco, some of their Art Deco stations, but that's a whole other <laughs> That's a rabbit trail. Another we'll topic. Today. Yeah, but um, you know, so I knew that. But you know, so if you just had the doors automatically opening, I might remember that. I might not. But it would bother you if you were like a native of that. Um, that's why I can har I can hardly stand to watch movies about the Washington D.C. Northern Virginia area because uh, they always get. <laughs> You never really film on the sky. No, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's not a metro stop at Arlington National Cemetery. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, yeah. 
there's one near there, but one doesn't stop actually at the cemetery. So, right. It's um, called it's called that, but people think that because it's called yeah. Arlington that it's actually right there. Yeah, yeah, but it's not. And it's easier no. to go from the Roslyn Station anyway, truly. I know, I know. It, yes. Well, we digress. If you're ever in Washington, D.C., you need to know the metro, you have two people to call. You can call me and call Tracy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll get you around. Yeah, so I find that um, it is fun, though, to to use our knowledge of places we've been or people we've met. Um, I often tell people, you better be nice to me or they might end up in my book. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, somebody you might not like. Um, but I'm always, you know, people watching too, which is so much fun. I've just loved to do that all my life. But especially now that I'm writing more because I'm like, oh, I want to, you know, I try not to be too nosy. But, you know, honestly, sometimes I've wanted to whip out my phone and say, hey, can you stop right there? Because I like that face for some a character. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> because I'm not, I'm really introvert. I'm not that bold. But I have thought about it. I love it. Yeah, and I, I do think that people watch, that's one of my favorite parts of traveling is the people watching, seeing how people interact. With, you know, like is somebody, you know, in a rush and they're like, okay, I've got to quick get into line and, you know, you're cutting everybody off or, you know, oh, I've got plenty of time. So, yeah, you can go in front of me. It's no problem. And a lot of times it's the same person can have different situations and we're going to act differently. Right. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I often, um, you know, eavesdrop on conversations. I'm like, well, how are they? What are they talking about? How are they talking? <laughs> I know. Is that terrible that we do this I know, all the yes, time? I do it all the time. Oh, my, my, we, you know. We need a T-shirt. Family. It's like I'm not really eavesdropping. I'm working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think a lot of writers would buy it. So that's uh -huh. a, that's a great that's a great idea, Tracy. Um, so how do you, um, what are some of your favorite ways to connect with readers? So um, now we talked about how we're a little bit voyeuristic, uh, watching people, looking at settings. Um, but how do you connect with the readers who read your novels? I, mean, I think one of my favorite ways is actually through social media. Like on Facebook, I actually have one called, a, a group called Tracy's Friends, and it's Tracy with an I, and it's, after so much negativity we had, you know, this year with just protests and politics, and there was just a lot of frustration in the world. And mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's just getting cabin fever and everything. So um, I just started this group, and it's been so much fun because it was just a positive place. Like, hey, come hang out, but we're all the complaints and everything. You can keep that someplace else. <laughs> you know, this is, <laughs> this is we're gonna just have fun. So you can talk about if you want to talk about writing or like throw pictures up of your pets and, you know, just funny things and stuff. And it's just been a, a blast because I feel like I'm getting to know readers on a more personal level. So that's been one thing that I've, I've really enjoyed. And, you know, sometimes like on Instagram and things like that, it's the same type of thing of, hey, this is what I'm making for dinner. And people are like, oh, mm. you know, like you're crazy or, oh, that sounds really good. And so, yes, I admit I put carrots in my smoothies. I'm weird. <laughs> That's so. okay. I I made kale smoothies for years before they became popular because <laughs> we had farm shares, and I'm like, what am I going to do with all this kale when my kids were little? And, you know, I mean, the kale never stopped. You know, <laughs> your kids <laughs> can only not. eat like a little bite and little bites of it. And so I would, yeah, yeah, they uh, they liked them until they didn't, but that was okay. Then they were older, and then they could like eat bigger pieces of kale, more kale. So yes, there we go. They, and they actually like kale. I have I have four kids, and they actually they actually like kale most of the time. <laughs> that, that's most impressive. You did good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I always try to create. You know, they, they, what do they say that you have to for a kid? They need to be exposed to a new food like I don't know, it's like, it's like seven, eight times before they decide yeah. whether they really like it. Oh so yeah. So I always try to say, well, you know, let's cook it like as many ways as possible in things so that they, you know, so that they can decide if they like it. Because they may not like it sautéed, but they may like kale chips, you know. So. Right. Oh, and I'm, I'm notorious. I, I've got five kids, and so I would, like, hide pieces of zucchini inside of baked ziti and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, I never enough, it. They'll read it. <laughs> yeah. I always just said, it's in there. Go ahead and eat it. And then, or I'd say, I have a mystery ingredient. See if you can guess it. <laughs> oh, I love it. fun, too. Yeah, okay, so there's a tip for everyone out there. Yep, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, the three other ingredients. Tip. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I did with my kids, because my mom did it with me, and I thought it was like brilliant, was that every year on like New Year's Day, they could pick for the whole year one vegetable, had to be a vegetable, that they did not have to eat. So, for example, one of my daughters picked eggplant. Uh huh. Hated it. I didn't, we didn't. I fixed it maybe three or four times a year. She just like hated it so much. That was her. But they had to eat everything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, or or they would have to have whatever they didn't like the next time it came around. So if you're free, free parenting tip today on food, <laughs> there you go. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So um, do you talk about food a lot in your books? I do. That the subject. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> I How do, do you weave that in? <laughs> you know, I think a lot, a lot of this, it's crazy things. Like, so I have this, you know, this one series of Navy SEALs it's called my Saint Squad series. And I have, like, you know, it's, it's a bunch of guys that are together, and they're together a lot, and, you know, it's like brothers type of thing. And, and so we'll have, like, you know, where did my food go? And somebody is like, well, you didn't lock it up. It's like it was inside my desk. Like, seriously? Right. You know, so things like that. And, um, like, you know, at one point I have the guys, you know, it was kind of a like a – one of those little semi-religious moments, you know, a lot of the, a lot of military, they'll, they'll actually pray before mission and things like that. And so Mm -hmm. they're like, okay, this one guy's, I'll pray today. And, and he prays and he prays for cinnamon rolls. Like, can we please have cinnamon rolls? (laughs) You know? (laughs) And it's like, so it's, sometimes it's just fun, you know, crazy stuff. And then other times it's just, you want to add like the flavor of where they are. Like if you're doing something in Paris, you have to have food. You know, there's right. just so many. It's, you know, you just want to make it more alive for the reader. But I did notice just recently that I'm more food heavy at the beginning of my story as we're getting to know my characters. And uh. then as the more tension happens, the food starts dropping off. It's like they had lunch, you know, instead of, oh, they sat down and what were they eating or what are they smelling and things like that. Because once you get tense, you don't care what you're eating. You just and right, do I have right. enough fuel to move forward? Am I alive? Right, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, great. I'm not going to, you know, have three pages on um, the spaghetti I was having at an Italian restaurant. Exactly. Um, so it, it is interesting. I think it's a pacing tool for me. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that that is interesting. I think my first... I don't know, when I really, really noticed food was um, Edith Wharton's uh, The Age of Innocence. I don't know if you've read that novel, but mm-hmm. she goes on for like a dinner party describing the food and the place settings for like pages and pages. Oh, um, wow. Kind of, I mean, it's fascinating because she wrote, you know, contemporary, but at the turn of the, of the you know, the Gilded Age in New York, and which is like the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so it was fascinating from that sense, but I just remember thinking about it. When I read that as a teenager or something, thinking, starting to dabble in writing, thinking, I don't think I could describe a meal that <laughs> with that many words. Right, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a lot. It's. I mean, I think some people did say, you know, it's kind of overkill, but it was interesting to kind of think about how she used food. She was making a statement about it, and I think about that too. Like you were saying, you know, sometimes you can use it to you know, do a setting, you know, whether they have time to eat, whether they don't, um, you know, do they have an allergy so they're always worried about eating. I mean, there's so many things. Oh, yeah, I've done that too. (laughs) With our character. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I think I read one of them had, like, came in contact with peanuts in a different book, and then that was not good for her. So, I mean, they can just, like, it's a very interesting, you know, kind of a – not a prop, but a um, like a almost like a character, I think, in our novels. So it's oh yeah, I, it's it's similar to your setting, you know, because you think about it, you know, when we're look, talking about using the different senses, mm-hmm. one of the easiest ways to use a sense of taste and smell is food, you know. So it's it's not it's something that we really it really can kind of bring breathe life into the pages, so that people feel like they're actually there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's always that's always um I think important to to draw the readers in and food is a great way to great way to do it. Although I have to be careful. <laughs> I noticed one of my um early books, one of my crit partners was like, "You know, you talk about tea an awful lot." Oh, that's <laughs> they were too always funny. making tea and I was laughing because I don't drink coffee. 
And I was like, oh, I guess I need to introduce characters who drink coffee because there's way more of those than there are of me. <laughs> That's too funny. I'm the same way. Like, I, am, I don't drink, drink tea or coffee, and so almost most of my characters will drink water. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess they could drink, like, at least juice or something. <laughs> yeah. But I, ha- I have food allergies, and my, I'm like, I have to remember that my characters don't. Like, all of them yes. don't have the same. Like, they could have... You know, they can have orange juice. I'm allergic to oranges. <laughs> like, right, oh, I can right. put that in my book. I know it was it was kind of funny. I, I just hadn't realized that. I mean, and, and one of my characters, you know, sometimes I've had a couple of characters who that was kind of part of their their character, and it was like mm-hmm. a running joke with someone, you know. But I realized, yeah, I really need to have them. So I just asked my husband, I said, okay, what are the coffee drinks people are drinking? Because I don't know. I'm like coffee and. I need to vary right. that up. Are they, are they is latte still a thing? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yes, and this is where we just and, and you know, I was talking about my my reader or my friends group on Facebook. Those are the kind of questions sometimes I'll throw out to them. Like, "Hey, has anyone read this or what do you think? Tell me like, can I borrow I need some parents' names. Like, I need to so I have some parents that need names. Who has parents I can borrow?" And so I'll just right. be random, you know, like, what's your favorite food or, you know, different things like that. And a lot of times it's so much fun to get because it goes beyond me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, all right, tell me about you, and then I have more things to draw from. Yeah, I think that's that's important. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I, since we've been talking about food, do you have yes. a particular, like, pick-me-up food or beverage when you're writing something that you find, you say you don't drink coffee or tea, is, and no orange juice for you, so I've got those down. What what do you like to drink if you need a little, like, or eat when you need a little, um, like, you know, inspiration? You know, writing? my go-to is always, I actually have the smoothie that I make, and it's just, it's veggie, it's a bunch of veggies and fruits in it, and that is what I have, like, normally when I'm working, I actually type um, while I'm walking on the treadmill okay. or on my exercise bike. And then as soon as I finish that, I go and have my smoothie, and it's like because it has like the spinach in it and some carrots and, you know, some things like that, you know, some, like blueberries and banana. So I, but that just gives me that energy, and I, I don't know, I just I tend to feel better when I'm eating more natural stuff, like sure. not yeah. out of a package. So that's yeah. my <laughs> pick-me-up is just – you know, oh, it's actually from a, you know, like the produce section. So, yeah, the produce section and I are very well acquainted. Okay. <laughs> Great. So. Well, thank you, Tracy. This has been fun. Um, now I'm hungry, and I should probably <laughs> not go in the kitchen uh, since we're recording this um, after dinner. So, okay. Uh, but thank Good you for point. being <laughs> yeah, for me, at least. Good. Thanks for being on my show. Well, thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I've been chatting with Tracy Hunter Aberson, um, and she um, has written more than 30 best-selling novels, and you can listen to an excerpt from her most recent one, Redemption. Now, an excerpt from Redemption by Tracy Hunter Abramson. Perspiration beaded on Eric's forehead. The plan had been so simple. Find the gun, go to school, get to his father's classroom. What came next blurred in his mind. His father wasn't here. Why wasn't he here? The pistol trembled in his hand. Twenty-nine terrified teenagers stared at him. Someone whimpered. A whisper of compassion stirred within Eric, but he stamped it out. These people didn't care about him. They only cared about themselves. Only Dr. Wahlberg cared about what life was really like at home. Only he knew about the monster Eric faced within those walls. These people didn't even know Eric's name. They didn't care about the beatings or the abuse or the pain. He took a step back pushing the pain from yesterday's beating out of his mind. Mrs. Cunningham, his special ed teacher, sat at a nearby desk. Why was she here? And why did she keep talking to him? You don't have to do this, Eric. Her voice trembled, but she kept going. Tell the police the truth. 
If you do that, you can get the help you need. You won't have to go home again. She had spoken those words before. She had filed a report with the counseling office, but the school counselor hadn't believed the truth. The principal hadn't believed it either, so why would the police? His father had them all fooled. He was Mr. Popularity when it came to high school teachers. Eric was an outcast, a nobody, a never mattered. He gripped the gun in his right hand the weight of it reminding him why he was here. He had a reason for being here. What, what was it again? His father, right. Why isn't my dad here? Eric had asked the question before, but he still couldn't understand the answer. I told you he didn't show up for work today. Mrs. Cunningham's hands shook. Did you see your father this morning before you left? Tch, no. The single word came out in a derisive snort. He never saw his father in the morning if he could help it. Even though they went to the same place every day, Eric always walked the ten blocks to school. It could be sleeting outside or pouring rain. It didn't matter. Eric walked. His father said he needed the exercise. But his father drove his flashy sports car, purchased with his dirty money. Could he have been sick? Mrs. Cunningham asked. Eric let out a quick expulsion of breath. He never gets sick. His mind churned along with the anger and the steady stream of Dr. Wahlberg's words running through his mind. Get the gun, hide in the bathroom, go to his father's classroom, aim, and fire. He flexed his fingers around the handle of the pistol once more. He could make them bring his father. His eyes scanned the frightened students and then landed on Mrs. Cunningham. With a wave of his weapon, he motioned to the phone hanging on the wall. Call the office. Tell them I want them to bring my dad here. She hesitated as though understanding what he planned to do. Eric, this isn't the answer. His eyes hardened and he aimed the gun at her. Do it! Tristan Crowther had nearly fired his weapon. He still wasn't sure what had stopped him from squeezing the trigger when the boy had lifted his gun. Perhaps it had been the look in his eyes. Oh, there had been anger all right, but he didn't want to hurt this woman. Tristan could sense it. The woman blinked hard against the tears swimming in her eyes and crossed the room to the phone. The boy lowered his gun fractionally, and Tristan let out a sigh of relief. They still had time. Chapter 1 a hotel conference room full of students. An unstable gunman. Gage positioned himself outside the door and peered through the opening. Even though the scene before him was a reenactment, he instinctively evaluated the situation. No outside windows, two doors. The gun, a 9 millimeter semi-automatic pistol. The owner, a white male in his late 20s. Gage rubbed his damp palms on his gray slacks and reminded himself to breathe. The door across from him remained closed. Where were the police? Surely that was where they would enter. A woman at the side of the room rose from her seat. Gage recognized the calm voice before he saw her face. Mrs. Cunningham, the woman who had saved his life. His gut clenched. He wasn't Eric anymore. He'd left that past behind. Today, he was simply an observer, not the man holding the gun. The would-be shooter waved his weapon in her direction, and Gage's heartbeat picked up speed. Shut up! The gunman took aim. Sit down and shut up! She didn't sit, 
nor did she stop talking. I'm not a threat to you. Her calm, soothing voice continued. You're the one with the gun. You're in control. Steely courage resonated within the words. No one has to get hurt. Those words transported Gage back in time to when he had been the man holding the weapon, and those words had been directed at him. Put the gun down, the woman continued. A hand gripped Gage's shoulder. Startled, he turned to see an enormous black man in full military gear carrying an assault rifle. Using hand signals, the man motioned for Gage to trade places with him. Gage took a step farther into the hall to leave the doorway clear. The man spoke into his communications headset. I've got a visual. Other classrooms are secure. The presence of a southern accent in the man's voice, the combat vest, the man's sheer size. Gage recognized all three traits from that day so many years ago, the day that continued to haunt his dreams. Inside the room, the gunman's words grew louder. Sit down or I'll shoot! Now! The military man by the door said quietly. A single gunshot sounded. Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.